<laughs> All right. Welcome back, everyone. Hey, Tom. Hopefully you had a chance to get a dream. Hey, hey. Um, so is your internet still down? It is. I am currently in a parking lot on the Mod Market Wi-Fi. <laughs> I brought my game team and a few friends a along. TMI, a little TMI in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we'll definitely. Um, I'll definitely try to line up the questions for you so there's not too much hopping around for you afterwards. Um, okay. Anything you wanted to say about your video before it started? Nope. I think there's a pretty good intro in there. All right. Awesome. All right, everybody. Start the video. So I realize you might think this topic is a joke, but it's not a joke. We're going to get very serious. But what is a joke is this. There are only two hard things in computer science, cash and validation, and naming things. I'm sure you've all heard this. And there's many variations, including the off by one error variant. But really, there are two hard problems in science. We have only one joke, and it's not funny, at least anymore. So why am I talking about jokes? You're here to learn about Gitmoji, and I'm gonna help you level up your Git commits. Now, who the heck am I? I'm Fatblat, and I admit I am an emoji overuser. But hopefully by the end of this talk, you will understand why and why I'm so excited about this topic. Because practicing Gitmoji may help you get better at naming things. And before we can get all the way to naming things, I need to take you through a few basic concepts first like a uh, quick emoji primer. Then we'll talk about, you know, Gitmoji itself and a tour through some of the like official emoji. And then uh, the theory that really uh, is behind, in, in my opinion, why this is a good practice as far as uh, some best practices for how to use Gitmoji and some tools to help you with that. So emoji, as I'm sure you're all aware, it's really just a standard set of characters that are available on all the major platforms. But note that the artwork for each emoji, it varies by platform, so they'll be the same across all the Apple platforms, but don't be surprised when your emoji look different on Twitter or on someone's Android phone, for example. So the, there's a couple of things to know about emoji itself. Every emoji has a name and a Unicode code point. That's part of the standard. What's not standard are these short codes, the uh, colon, uh, surrounded terms. Those are actually application specific and while lately a lot of the different applications like Slack and GitHub often use the same thing for new ones, some of the older ones might be different across the platforms. Now Emojipedia is a great place to go to research specific emoji because there are thousands of them. And the really big thing about emoji is that it is a standard. It, it actually, the first emoji made their way into Unicode 6 back in 2010. And then in 2015, uh, there was actually a separate standard called Emoji 1 that came out right after Unicode 8. Uh, but then they realized that it was really confusing, that there were two different numbers, because um, Emoji 1 is like a subset of Unicode 8. Uh, so they skipped ahead and aligned the versions, uh, starting with um, Unicode 11 and Emoji 11 back in 2018. Uh, so now they're on a relatively annual cadence. Uh, you all have Emoji 12 on your iPhones. Emoji 13 will probably be out with iOS 14.1. Usually Apple uh, updates their emoji set in the first update after a major version. And as of uh, this upcoming version of Emoji, there are 3,304 emoji. But Emoji 14 is actually going to be delayed into 2022. So those of us that are waiting for new and exciting emoji will have to wait just a little bit longer. OK, so now, Gitmoji. This is really just an, an emoji guide for your commit messages. The name is pretty obvious. It's just a concatenation of Git and emoji. It was created by a young developer in Spain called Carlos Cuesta. And it's just a set of 60 emoji for categorizing commits. And this may change over time because people are always adding new suggestions. But you don't have to memorize all 3,300 emoji, just a subset of these 60. 
we'll get into that in a little bit when we get to the tour. So actually Gitmoji is a lot like uh, another practice called conventional commits. And I didn't know about this until I, um, I talked with Carlos about it, but conventional commits is, is a text-based format for sort of classifying your commits. You know, putting feet for a feature commit or docs when you're just um, adding a commit that works on docs. Uh, so this is actually a standard. I've seen people use things like this across GitHub. I had no idea there was, there was a real standard. But Gitmoji is a lot more fun. And it turns out Carlos was inspired to create Gitmoji based on Adam's contribution guidelines. Under their Git commit messages, they actually have categorized which, com which emoji they use. Uh, and, and it's not, not everybody uses them, but at least they have a, a standard so you know what each uh, symbol means when you see it in a commit message. And here's a, a little sample of um, you know, some commits from some of the stuff that I've worked on. Uh, if you take a look at anything I, I push up to GitHub, I'm always putting uh, Gitmoji in there, so that's one place to look. So now let's take a quick tour through a few of these fun and meaningful characters. So here's Tada, or the party popper emoji. And this is traditionally used for the first commit in a project. So, you know, like git init and you add your commit uh, because what else are you going to put in there? Sparkles is when you're for introducing new features. The bug or caterpillar is used for marking when you fixed a bug. The white check mark is used when you're only um, adding a commit or a commit that only has adding or updating tests. Arrow up, I use this a lot as a library developer because I'm always updating dependencies. The red rotating light is for uh, removing linter warnings. Lipstick is often used for up a commit that just updates UI and style files. And the fire uh, is one of my favorites uh, when you're removing code or files. The easiest way to clean up a project is to delete that old stuff. Art is for improving structure or format of code. So, you know, the kinds of things SwiftLint or your um, style guides might tell you to do. And Boom is for introducing breaking changes, another one that um, is great on uh, library projects because if you see that in the history, you know that uh, you need to bump the major version of the library. And the bookmark is used to mark a, a commit that bumps the version, uh, you know, Usually you do this, it's the last thing you do before a release. The construction worker is often used when you're uh, changing files like a Travis um, or uh, other CI build system configuration file. And for other configuration files like maybe the build itself, uh, the wrench is traditionally used for that. And I have my own uh, convention of actually using the hammer and wrench icon. Uh, when I when I touch something that's Xcode configuration files like the project, and that's my fat bot suggestion for Apple devs. So got all that memorized? That was only twelve of the whole thing. There's there's a full guide online, uh, and you don't need to memorize them uh, because really you'll find that often you're using the same ones uh, regularly. And sometimes you might need to go back to the guide, but we'll get into that with the tools. So what does this have to do with naming things, Ben? We're looking at emoji. Well, it really boils down to, this is a brain exercise. And you might think of naming things as just making a decision, but there's actually a whole bunch of stuff going on in your brain before you can make a decision. And if, if you're not exercising, uh, that group of stuff is collectively called executive function. And if you're not uh, working on that and exercising that part of your brain, then making the decisions can be hard because that's the end of the process when, when you finally decide. So let's dig into this. Now, this is not a comprehensive uh, scope of executive function. There's actually more areas than this, but I focused in on five main parts uh, of this umbrella term for neurologically based skills. So first one is working memory. Uh, this governs our ability to retain and manipulate distinct pieces of information over short periods of time. So you've heard that context switching is bad. You know, you 
get in uh, deep on a development problem and then the phone rings or you know your kid is distracting you and this is what gets dumped when you switch contexts. Uh, so being able to have good working memory uh, can help with some of these things. And mental flexibility is another part. This helps us sustain or shift attention in response to different demands or apply different rules in different settings. So for example, writing code versus crafting commit messages. These, you need to constantly flex back and forth uh, to think about, well, what did I do versus um, actually doing it? And this is a key one that I think really uh, plays into the ability to abstract well. And it's, it's one thing that all developers really need to practice because this is the, that's the key to uh, building bigger things or, or um, you know, moving into like architecture type work. Self-control, trying to uh, resist the impulse to go do something that's off topic of, of what your task is. And self-monitoring, just keep keeping track of what you're doing. This goes further in, you know, being aware of, you know, ergonomics and that sort of thing, but it's part of the, that whole executive function bit. And there's also planning, you know, like thinking ahead to what you're going to change, like being conscious and have, you know, having that goal in mind that I'm going to fix this bug and not worry about that misalignment over there because that's next on the list. And uh, problem solving. Problem solving is actually all the stuff that leads up to the decision. It's, it's that uh, gathering of possible solutions, uh, you know, either by inventing uh, those solutions or discovering other ones that you aren't aware of. And finally, we get to decision making. This is taking the action, you know, choosing that variable name or choosing the emoji. So this is why I, I think these two activities are very similar. Playing around with these fun little emojis is a little brain exercise for you to help get good at decision making and figuring out how you yourself can organize your thoughts and, and memories in order to get good at decision making. And the TLDR is it really just makes you think more about your commit messages and, and the contents of those commits. So now let's get into some Gitmoji best practices. The big one is one emoji per commit message. Uh, think of it like a label. On a GitHub pull request, you would add a label to say, mark this pull request as a bug. In a similar fashion, this uh, bug emoji is marking that commit as a commit that fixes a bug. And if you're wanting to cram more emoji in there, it's a sign that your commit may not be focused. I, I've certainly been guilty of this myself. You know, I put several things in there because I'm like, oh, I did all these things. But then I look back on that and I'm like, you know, I actually should have broken that up. And it can be difficult to choose between some of the emoji at first because they seem redundant. For example, the ambulance is used for a hot fix. But really, uh, one has higher precedence. The ambulance is a special kind of bug, one that you want to flag as you know, this needs to get out there quickly. And if people are merging between branches, they could see that and know, ah, there's that hot fix that I was waiting for, so I know I got the right branch. So in this case, you would not use the caterpillar bug emoji, you'd use the ambulance instead. And there's a bunch of platform-specific emoji in, in Gitmoji, but if you're on a, a single platform project like iOS, there's no need to use those. That's redundant information to like include the, the green apple in every commit. But if you were making a change on watchOS only, maybe you would include the watch emoji as a classifier. That's not actually a standard Gitmoji one, but I use it sometimes to call out that I'm working on my watch right now. So another good suggestion, kind of like the, the Atom contribution guidelines, is document your use. A small section in contributing, just mentioning that you use Gitmoji and having a link to where they can find out more about Gitmoji is a great way to sort of um, invite people to take part in using Emoji and, and knowing what your team uses. Especially if you use any special emoji like some of the ones I've called out. And one idea for the link is you now have a second place to link to, like this talk, in addition to the Gitmoji website. And just practice it. Try it out on your own. You know, here's a few commands you can run in a terminal just to 
uh, create a little git repo and create your first commit. Then play with it. But one big caveat is be cognizant of platform support. Those emoji versions I alluded to before, Apple adopts these regularly, Android as well, uh, because they're used often on uh, mobile platforms. But if someone's running an old version of Mac OS, you know, maybe uh, you have people across your team that work on different platforms like Windows, there isn't as good a emoji support on some of those other ones. And so if you use short codes instead, you can have better compatibility, but it kind of depends on who's consuming this code. And you can always research support for, you know, which, which version of emoji is in each one of these, um, or, or each uh, character is in up on Emojipedia. And don't use Gitmoji everywhere. I have done this and it has caused problems. Like on web content, I didn't use short codes, I used the actual emoji character and uh, Windows counterparts at my work were not able to see it. They just see like a little box. I've also completely broken Jenkins' jobs by putting emoji in the names. Bad idea. But maybe you could include them in pull request titles and, and GitHub release titles. It, that starts diverging from the, the purpose of, of Gitmoji, which is about focused, small, perp, single purpose commits. And a pull request is often not single purpose. It might have a few things in it. And a release could have a lot of things in it. Okay, now the fun tools. So Gitmoji has a command line. Uh, we're going to look at that. There's also the standard macOS character picker. If the, the key commands for that are too hard, there's some software to help with it, and there's um, a cool app. So this is your number one place to go for learning about Gitmoji. It's uh, Carlos Cuesta's website. Lists them all with descriptions and that sort of thing. That's your online cheat sheet. And you can install the node Gitmoji CLI. And I'll show you a couple of the commands here. This um, example command installs this as a global node module, not a project specific one, so that you can run it no matter which project you're in. So Gitmoji list is the easiest command to run. It just lists the full set of emoji that are there. And uh, there's actually a command to update the list. Like if they extend it, uh, you can run the update command to sort of bring down a new cache of, of these, but list is the easy way to look at them all. There's also search. However, I had some weird results come back. I got beers as the first one, but there was stuff that was unrelated to beer in there, so I, I don't know how well that works. Gitmoji actually has a, a whole interface for c creating the commit where you can it does a git commit after it take, walks you through a flow. So the first question in the flow is picking an emoji. You can search through here or scroll, which is pretty handy. And then you craft your, your git title and message, which is really just the first line or, or further down in that full commit message. But it creates the commit for you and adds that emoji in there so you don't have to do anything else. Pretty handy. So now over to the standard macOS character viewer. This can be invoked with control, command, and space. And it's kind of a, a, you know, hard to hit all those characters at once, but this is immensely useful, especially because it remembers the, the most frequently used 32 emoji. Note that the button in the upper right hand corner uh, toggles that from this flyout view to a full view where it has more browsability, which is cool if you're exploring, but then uh, it I find it best to click that button again to go back to this flyout so you can have a quick little picker as opposed to a giant window getting in the way. So there's an app, a free open source app called Carabiner Elements. This is has immense capabilities uh, and um, it's open source because it really is a key logger, but you can customize your keys with a whole bunch of things, including uh, this emoji key, um, example um, and you can create your own but I haven't actually gone that far I just wanted to include this in case you wanted a software solution for it I actually use a hardware solution 
Uh, there's a number of programmable keyboards out there, like ErgoDocs EZ, and I have um, a key bound to bring up that picker. Yes, I said I use a lot of emoji. And Rocket is a great app. It's actually free, but there's a, a pro uh, paid thing to get more features. This uses that shortcode style where you can type in pretty much any app and you can uh, exclude certain apps like Slack that already support this functionality. But what's cool about Rocket, especially the pro features, is you can give emoji custom aliases. So if you can't remember that Tada is the uh, short code for the party popper and in the Mac OS uh, character viewer, you have to type party, uh, Tada won't bring it up. Uh, you can add the extra aliases with Rocket, so it's very easy to, to get to them. And that's it. Go forth and emojify thine commits. Thank you. So it seems we have lost Ben in the parking lot. Thank you.